So this is an indie event. We, we make the speakers work for us. Install the seats. Um, so first, um, could you tell me a little bit about your, your philosophies uh, as game companies and some of your major releases for people who might not know you? I'm not sure there are any, but anyway, let's make the effort. Uh, Roberta, can you start? Uh, yes, so Bossa uh, have been trading for eight years. Our biggest games are Surgeon Simulator uh, and I Am Bread. We're very well known for creating very YouTubeable and Twitchable type of experiences, emergent gameplay and com comedy. Uh, our latest game is called uh, World of Drift, which is not com comedy, but it's uh, it's kind of a, a reinvention of, of an MMO. And you've, I told you already, we have 80 people all based in London, and we make game jams on a monthly basis. Romain, maybe? Um, so, hi, so I'm uh, Romain. Uh, so, we are Amplitude based in Paris. Uh, we are 90 people. Uh, and uh, we also are created like eight years ago, actually. So, and we are f mostly famous for the endless series of games. So, it's, uh, it's games about strategy, uh, mostly a sub genre of strategy called 4X. And what made us a bit different is at the time we decided to create our games together with the community and ask them to vote for content as we were creating the games. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, so um, it's really nice you know, to be here and just talk about what we're doing at Voodoo. Um, so what we do actually is um, we make very snackable, um, en engaging, uh, simple games uh, for the widest audience as possible. Um, and we do that with very small teams um, that have incredible ownership and uh, who have a very data-driven process. And uh, some games that we made last year, for example, was uh, uh, Helix Jump, uh, Snake vs. Blocks, and uh, Paper.io. And that amounted um, to about 1.5 billion downloads in 2018. So yeah, we're quite happy about that. Humble bragging. So one-fifth of the planet, basically. Not, not bad. Um, so the title of this panel is Great Culture Makes Great Game. R Roberta, I know that BOSA is all about creativity. Uh, could you please tell us how this translates through the studio and what you do to, uh, to make that happen in the studio? Yeah, so through the game jams that we do on a, on a monthly basis, we stop the whole company for two or three days to do that. And that means that we don't have like a top-down type of decision-making. Um, it's everyone is leveled playing field, basically. HR person with a marketing person with a game designer can collectively decide to create a game in one of the game jams. And so that, that instills a lot of um, kind of a sense of ownership, a sense of autonomy in the, in the culture. And everyone kind of feels that they are part of something bigger because they're not being told what to do. They're actually the ones behind creating something new. And also they realize that failure is very, very part of succeeding. Uh, they know that sometimes a great game idea is gonna turn out to be a terrible player, playable uh, and the other way around, right? Like a, a terrible idea might become a pretty good game. And so for, for culture perspective, it's very important that we all feel that we're connected making something bigger together. Are there games not born out of Game Jam? Or are yeah. they, all the games you shipped, they were made at some point during your Game Jam? They were, yeah. All of our roadmap is, uh, is, fu is fulfilled by, I don't know if <laughs> <laughs> should use this word, with, uh, with games that come from Game Jam. So uh, Surgeon Simulator came from Game Jam, uh, Iron Bread, World of Drift, and we have another two on the pipeline for this year and next year that also came from Game Jams. We create about 10 games every single month. Cool. So Gabriel, as you said, Voodoo is very famous for being uh, a data-driven company, uh, shipping games in one day and then trashing them or polishing them till you get data uh, to where you want to be. Um, can you explain to us how that works and how it shapes the, the company culture? Yeah, sure. So um, I actually started um, in 2016. 
Um, at that point, we started publishing games from external studios. And uh, we had two games. The first one was um, Fight List, and the second one was Numerous Quiz. And so uh, we were all testing the games amongst our friends. And everyone loved Numerous Quiz, which was like quite a numerical game. And uh, everyone hated Fight List, just absolutely hated it. And, um, and so we released both. And one was a failure, like a total failure. It was so bad that we thought there was bugs in the game. There was no bugs. Um, and the other one was quite successful. And in fact, the one that was successful was the one that everyone thought would be a, a failure. And after that, we understood that we just had to test our intuitions with data. Um, so we came up with a process, which is quite simple. It's you prototype the game, and you try to prototype it as fast as possible. So you get to the core of the gameplay, and you release it on the store, and then you test it with real users. Um, with this, we have you know, some KPIs, um, and if it hits these KPIs, we, uh, we continue with the game, we iterate, we launch it. And if it doesn't, then we just kill it. Um, and so this, you know, this really means that we have to look for certain qualities in people, and it's uh, ownership, because people have to um, follow the game for the whole life cycle, so from prototyping, all the way to launching the game. The second one is delivery. You know, you have to have the discipline to kill. And lastly, it's um, is only, only focusing on the games that will be successful, that will impact millions of users, and and being able to say, you know, some of your intuitions are, are bad, and um, you just have to move on. Cool. And is there a point where you feel like data is not enough, or that might be, you know, that might be counterintuitive, or you might like turn around the cycle, or is that a, a fear for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, you can't create a game with data, that's for sure. Um, you need emotion, you need intuition, um, and all you can do is verify your intuition with data. So um, we have, you know, moments in the creative process where just we just, you know, brainstorm and try to think about something which is kind of what the fuck, right? Um, but then you do have to test it because, um, we're usually not our audience. You know, we're gamers, and our audience are um, just everywhere in the world. So yeah, we, ha we need data after that. But it's not stressful. Romo, so <laughs> Amplitude, uh, as at least to me, seems to have really pioneered the, the co-design trend that we see these days, uh, going super in-depth with the community from the very beginning of the project and the very beginning of the company. Can you tell us how it shaped the studios and what you do on a daily basis to make that happen as well? So, um, um, so for me, I'm the creative director of the of the company, and my biggest fear ever uh, is to make a great game, which is a good thing, right? But, but a great game that nobody would play, and that's my biggest fear. So, um, how to fix that for us was actually creating a method to work with the community very early on. Um, so we're talking about 2011, 2012. So, so that, that's why right at the time was a bit, you know, uh, frightening to do that. Um, but the plan was to, as soon as we're like writing documents, to share these documents with our community, and have them, you know, help us to shape it. So basically, we had a very good idea of where we wanted to go, the final point. We were not so sure about the, the path to get there. And, and actually, our community helped us to, to go there and all along. And actually, they were the ones reassuring us, telling us, that's good, you know, you should do it. You should spend time on it. Or sometimes telling us, don't waste time on that. And to know that during the production is amazing. And obviously, um, you have to shape a company around that. Uh, it's not just something that, that you add on top. Uh, because if you do that, basically, you don't listen or or you will listen when you have some time, and if maybe you know you can do something about what they said, you will try to do something. Here, it's all about you know having hiring more designers, more producers. Uh, we consider actually uh, being part of the job of a producer and a game designer to be a community manager. You know, it's part of the job, so they have to be skilled in actually interacting with the community. Um, of course, in English, so in France, it does also change a bit who you recruit. Uh, but uh, yeah, we need inter international profiles for this um, this kind of people, and sometimes it, it it could go even beyond that because it creates a sense of um, that you know 
when you are in the, the team making the game, actually, you are the first community of the game. So actually, the first reactions actually as are uh, first community members. And actually, what's funny is then we realize that when sometimes the way we look at our community is actually to be the extension of our own team. So it, it does create that s uh, strange feeling and uh, a sense of ownership of the game on the individual team members, especially now that we have a growing team, uh, it does make it even stronger. Um, so instead of having people who feel that they should only do their own little portion of the game and just go home, uh, they, they're always going to watch um, or read what the players do with the game or how they, they react to what they have done uh, personally. And they definitely don't want to see players who say, well, you know what, I don't really like that character. You know, I don't like the way it's played. I don't like the way it's uh, even painted, portrayed by the writer. So um, the, 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 the basically the, the, the intentions of the creators, of the individual creators of the games uh, are to basically please and, and motivation is, is there just for that. Basically. And sometimes, you know, when you're in develop development and you're just blinded, uh, because you don't know that people didn't play the game yet, you don't know when they will play the game. Um, as a manager or the team or the creative, you will tell your team, "Well, don't worry. You know that's how you know the players will react." But you know you don't know about it, and like you, sometimes you're wrong. Most of the times you're wrong, and that it helps in communication with the team because we're all talking about the same thing. And something we're seeing on our side that sometimes the community can be quite toxic as well. So how do you protect your employees from that toxicity? And how are you able to separate you know, the, the good feedback from the stuff that, you know, just like toxic stuff? So uh, actually, right now, we've been chatting with quite a, a lot of big teams actually very interested by the, 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 the games together. And it's the first fear is this one. That one is like, OK, my team, my sorry, my community is toxic. You know, so with the games together, it will be even worse, you know, because they will have even more tools to express themselves and, and tell us how much they hate us, you know, and actually, so then they will impact the game development in a hateful way and the game will be awful. Uh, it's the other way around. Uh, honestly, I don't think I can really, really explain it fully, um, but as the, the, the community feels listened to, uh, it does reduce toxicity mm. level and they are very good at uh, self-policing each other's basically. And as we interact a lot, very quickly, a lot of players in the community uh, understand how we react, how we look at the game design, uh, and themselves, they can start to give answers for us to other uh, team members, or sorry, community members. So when new community members arrive, just maybe just to complain, because sometimes you have new people coming only to complain, right? That's the usual thing. Uh, a while back, you know, we used to say that people uh, were coming mostly to complain, and very few people uh, were coming to be constructive. It's all the other way around if you start from the beginning to listen to them. When actually, when someone comes to complain, other community members will talk to him and he will switch side very quickly. Um, for us, toxicity is not an issue yet. And we have something like 300 or 400,000 players uh, in the community uh, being active. I'm not talking about the full number of players. It's only maybe 10% of our players. Uh, but it's a lot and we could see a lot of toxicity and we've seen like much smaller community, community being toxic. Um, I think it's a, it's a matter of creating that trust level with the, the community and, and, and again, it does feed back to the team itself. So maybe toxicity is a lack of expression from, from the community and when you feel if like you give you know, people will not hate, they, they, they tend to feel that you know, if they yell loud enough, you know, if they are being insulting enough, maybe you will listen or you will have to come down and do something about it. Uh, but if right away you do something, it does reduce that level. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm sure you know you will find limits to that. But uh, so far, so good. Cool. Um, in in the in the last few months, more and more reports of toxicity, but not from the community in the studios. Uh, lack of diversity, constant crunch. Uh, I've hit the news. So, what's your take on these issues? I'm sure you know your your, uh, your studio are really healthy in that regards. But you know, uh, what do you do to prevent this stuff from uh, from happening? Who wants to uh, to start on this big one? No one, Gabriel, maybe. Um, I think one thing we do is we we um, we tend to hire uh, people who are quite young, so right out of school. Um, 
Uh, so that's one thing. Um, so they're probably potentially less, you know, um, influenced. Uh, another thing is that we, um, you know, we're a creation studio, but we also have a lot of marketing. Um, so that means it brings in different personalities, you know, people who went to business schools or like uh, who did like advertisement. Um, so it's not just one closed, uh, you know, um, fish tank of, of just production people. So I think that, you know, allows things to balance out. Yeah, I think uh, we're probably very similar. I, uh, yeah, we, we have 20 nationalities amongst 80 people. Um, and people from all, all ages and walks of life. Uh, also publishers and developers, so which naturally attract uh, quite different skill set. We skew towards millennials, so majority of our people are millennials. And uh, can go on and on about millennials, but you know, it's. Uh, I, I think that there's something about belonging that we have been uh, creating since the beginning. We're very, very protective about how people feel belonging inside the organization, like promoting a lot of things, like you know, um, games night, and you know, kind of getting together. Uh, there's someone who who's kind of building drones nowadays, and and we just he's just like has his drone filming everything in the office every Friday night while we're having drinks there. So the, there's something about collectively enjoying ourselves and doing things together that um, they internally make us all hopefully be very happy to be to be going to work every day. Um, well, it's toxicity for us uh, in the office is not much of an, an issue. We're not a crunching company uh, either. I think the on the founders, you know, we're quite a, a lot of uh, people who have seen a lot of crunch uh, before, so it's not something we wanted to, to, to renew. Nobody wants to, to ever do crunch, and it does happen, basically. But uh, we all know that, you know, with a good organization and, and a way to just, you know, from the beginning refuse it, um, it, it, it can basically not happen. I mean, we basically never had crunch. The fact that we never had crunch mean that we didn't have over time. You know, we had you know some nights you know that were a bit longer than others. You know, I'm talking about real crunching for months and you know and weeks. Uh, it's not something that's uh, and we'll never encourage that. Basically, we rather add days and months and you know and maybe years to the release of a game rather than to say, well, you know, we'll see next month and you know you all have to not sleep basically. So um, anyway, that's not an issue, uh, but. Definitely, to go back on some of the problems of, of the industry, and we're talking a lot about that today, is if you look at Empathy today, it is, you know, a white male studio, basically. I mean, not just white males, but, you know, it's basically, and young, because we really have also issues, you know, with that. I'm probably the oldest, no, not the oldest one. I'm the second oldest one in the office. So, so thank God we have Jeff. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, so it, it, it is, yeah, it is something we have to work on, and and it's true, it's not easy because just looking at the resumes we, we, we receive, uh, it's, yeah, it's, they all look like us, basically, you know, so, so we, we're trying to put some faces, you know, uh, of, you know, of amplitude that are different from us, but uh, to try to change that. But it's true, it's, uh, I think the, the roots of the evil goes way beyond uh, that. And, and we definitely want to, to, anything we can do to improve that is for us with, through our games. We try to basically really, uh, uh, think inclusive in the games themselves as much as we can. So if we can do much yet in the studio, and we hope we'll get better on that, um, uh, at least maybe through our games, through creating a generation uh, with uh, more female players uh, playing our games that maybe who will one day want to join the studio because they want to create, to play, uh, create the games they play, basically. So. So perfect transition. Um, well speaking of millennials, we have th this new generation that comes uh, in the uh, in the workplace with very different values uh, and motivation from the the previous generation, and we kind of uh, have to tailor our cultures around that. And uh, I wanted to know maybe Gabriel, uh, all of you uh, at this point, you know what what did you do at some point? We were like, oh, we're not. Work, you know, what's what we're building is not fit for these people. So, what do we have to do to to change or to make sure that the new generation and the generation maybe after that uh, can come working in our studio and be in the right place? Who's the who's going first on that? Uh, Roberta. So yeah, majority of our, 
I'm Generation X, just about, almost millennial. Uh, well, for, first, there are loads of myths, right? So first one is that they don't like as much avocado as we think they do. Uh, I typically make this joke because it's like, that's true. They already told me that. It's like, everyone thinks we love avocado, but we don't love as much. Um, <laughs> so I, I think there's this perception of social entitlement, of entitlement. And, and I think there's, a, again, a, a massive myth because this generation is actually, at least in the UK, they're having way more difficulty to kind of, you know, get a stable job and get to, you know, even uh, have hopes to buy their home, right? So they, they're sharing, the, they're flat sharing until they are like 35 or et cetera. And so I think the way that we deal with that is to, to level with, with them all the time and, and learn from how... Um, how they behave, because if you think through deeply, they grew up in this day and age where um, everything that they learned uh, has been hugely influenced by the internet and they possibly learned a lot on the internet, which is a place where um, you, you don't need to feel frustrated until you feel you mastered something. Right. And and I think they go to the workplace and they think that they're going to do the job for the first time and they're going to nail it. And then they don't. And I think what we need to do as leaders and managers is to actually give them feedback and the means for them to succeed, because they think that they, you know, it's like failure is not an option or I don't I cannot fail because I never failed on the Internet. Right. And. I think we changed a few things as well from a, from a HR perspective in the company, which is to, to give more frequent feedback. So the, the sense of immediacy that uh, tell me now if I'm doing the right thing or not, don't, don't wait to talk to me every six months, right? This whole performance management thing, like every six months you evaluate the person and every year is just totally out of place nowadays. You need to be constantly there and giving feedback and helping and coaching your team to, to kind of progress. So I think as much as we, uh, we might get annoyed with a, a few things that millennials do on the day to day, I think we have a lot to learn and to create better organizations to, uh, to, to get the best out of, out of these amazing people. Um, so I think, I guess a company has to just put things in place that actually, um, uh, that any generation wants, so it should transcend generations, right? So uh, I, th I really feel that people want to want, you know, a couple of things. They want to stay themselves within a company, you know, keep their own personalities. Um, they want to be free, right? Um, and they want to own, uh, they want to own their projects they work on, and they want those projects to have impact. Um, so very simply, what we do is uh, we have this value of ownership. Right, so um, you really own, you're in a small group of people where you really own the projects you work on. And uh, this means that, well, millennials or new people who come into the company, they, um, since they have this ownership, they, you know, they prototype fast, they fail fast, and they learn fast. So I think that's, that's one thing we do to kind of solve that problem. So um, a more specific question maybe for, uh Romain and Gabrielle, sorry, Roberta, but if you want to answer, yeah, please be my guest. Um, what do you think are uh, the French specificities that can impact your, uh, your game studios in, in a positive or, or in a negative way? Because uh, we, the objective from this event, we're looking at Finland, the Nordics, where the ecosystem is so uh, tight and, uh, and really comes together. And sometimes it feels it's a bit more difficult here. So we wanted to do something about that. Uh, and Anna wanted to, uh, to have your take on you know, what was good, what was bad, what we need to improve, and what we can be proud of. Um, I think a specificity that we have. So, so uh, when we, are, uh, we were acquired by Sega like a couple of years ago, and one of the things we told them to try to, to, to be seducing, to, to tell them you know, how great it was to buy a studio in France. Um, one thing we told them, and uh, I think they, they heard that, is I think the chance that we have is that we are kind of um, a Latin Germanic country. We are an engineer artist country, basically. And it's very interesting to, to see that when you look at the schools that we have, 
uh, look at the formations that we have uh, in France, we have amazing engineers, amazing artists. And it's not given like to every country in the world. You know, you have amazing engineers countries and amazing artists countries, and sometimes you have both. But you have, when you have the chance to have both and to have, to have such a long history of engineers and artists, it's an uh, amazing chance. And I think it's probably one of the reasons why video game can be str uh, thriving in France. So that's on the positive side uh, for me, and uh, it's quite incredible. Another thing that, um, well, I'm sorry, I would say more on the uh, other hand. Uh, so when we created Amplitude, um, one of the biggest fear uh, we had was to, to fall in the negative trap. You know, being French, you know, I think we all know that uh, we like to complain a bit. We, you know, we don't like to say things are good all the time. You know, we like to say, ah, it's okay, it's not bad. You know, but so, so it's our typical way of doing it. And it's true when you work on a video game, um, uh, everything can go wrong from there. Actually, again, I'm being French, you see. So it's uh, that's why we you need some positive sides, and uh, and that's why why it's something we try every day. Uh, to push back to the to our employees and uh, everyone working at uh, Amplitude, um, it's it, even in the way you know we, we we discuss about you know our past uh, work. You know it's like okay, you know we're not just here to criticize. We're also here to pinpoint what what is good, what worked well. So when everyone presents, you know what they have done during the week or the past sprint, uh, is not just talking about. What is not good, but to to you know uh, applaud, uh, point something that uh, amazing achievements for someone done, and it, it does create something positive that feeds one to another. And and uh, so, but anyway, I always fear of that negative side. Um, one thing I really like uh, with you know the French team is, um, is we you know there's no bullshit. It's uh, once everyone's uh, okay on the first principles, it's just, you know, everyone just moves on, can have really positive conflicts um, to grow the game, you know, and that's, uh, that's really cool. No negative. <laughs> so not so French. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, thanks everyone. I think it's time to, uh, to take maybe some questions from the audience. Uh, do we have any questions? So thank you for the talk. Um, you said earlier that uh, it was good to look at KPIs uh, when you launched the games that you were building. So the first question is, how could you, um, do you look at the same KPIs for, the, for the, all of the games that you're launching? And how it, do you find the best KPIs to look at? Thank you. Um, so I think if you really simplify things, there's three things you have to look at. Um, the first thing is um, how attractive is your game? And uh, that means how marketable is it? Will people want to play it when they see it? And the KPI for that is CPI, uh, cost per install. Uh, the second KPI you want to look at is um, how um, engaging is your game? Do people come back and play it? You know, players? And for that, you have to look at retention. Um, and the last one is um, LTV. So uh, are people willing to spend money in it or are people willing to stay in long enough to watch enough ads um, uh, so you can make your money back? Um, so, you know, those are the three KPIs we, can, we look at. Obviously, you can, um, you can go deeper into it. Um, but for this case, it's quite good to be simple, you know, um, just keep it to those. A very specific question. A uh, question maybe more about culture. No, no culture, still a very specific question. People want to know 1.5 billion games. Do we have another question? No question? Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the panel. Uh, my question uh, relates to culture and specifically the difference between uh, maybe the French ecosystem and uh, a more uh, English e ecosystem. Uh, Roberta, you were talking before about uh, your experience uh, building the company and uh, your studio, and you were talking about uh, A-level investments, stuff like that, the VCs, uh, some 
this is something that I feel is uh, uh, very well developed in uh, in the English culture, the, the way you relate to uh, investment and the way to build up companies. In France, I find that the studios that we have, uh, more often than not, they don't speak about this side of things. So I was wondering, uh, especially from the perspective maybe of uh, French studios, uh, how does it uh, feel having to build a studio in France in regards to maybe not having access to this culture of um, a more widespread culture of financing and building up with finances coming in to grow, uh, which is maybe something that we found more uh, away from France and not necessarily in France. Um, so it's true. There's something in France where uh, you know money is dirty, right? So we don't talk about money. We we talk about players, not customers. You know, we always try to avoid talking too much about that. Um, uh, in our case, we we built the studio, um, uh, getting money from our friends. So it's a friends and family funding. So we had 47 friends with like each one tipping in. Uh, and we did that, uh, I think the f one of the first, uh, the last time we asked the, their um, uh, money, we had our interns actually helping us with everyone. So, so in a way, these interns who today are pillars of the company uh, were really involved in, you know, uh, you know, getting the cash. And, and you know, for a couple of years, you know, uh, money was not an easy thing, you know. So uh, looking at Mathieu over there who uh, was uh, with me on that side and uh, it was not always easy. But anyway, we, t we took money and, and they knew that, you know, um, we needed money to survive. Um, so <sighs> it's true that s s since we've been past these two years, basically, we never really took money with, you know, our, our employees and we tend to focus more on the players and everything, and that is, yeah, you know, I agree with you. It's uh, when, when uh, you know, so we'll, working with Sega, a uh, base in London, you know, when we arrived over there, uh, you know, it's it's true. It seemed to be a very different culture, um, but yeah, uh, and 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 I'm more uneasy myself. I think even when I'm there talking about it, so um, I don't have a, a great an answer with that. But uh, uh, it's basically. We all, I don't know how many of you guys here in the room have been, you know, uh, pitching in to, to get some investors coming in. And I think I think it's fine that, you know, as creators, you know, when we ask for money, that people see that we are uneasy with it. I think it's okay, as long uh, as, long as we're being real realistic. Uh, it's more, I think, with your first employees being a small studio and, and so the relationship about money is, I think, more different. But uh, I don't know how that would be for you. At the beginning, how, how was it when, you know, you were, a young startups and you had the first employees. Did you talk about money all the time? Definitely not. Um, we so three co-founders, myself and my two co-founders, we put our, our savings into the company to start. And we worked with freelancers so that because we didn't know how long <laughs> you know it would last. <laughs> Uh, and then in the meantime, uh, my co-founder started pitching to investors until we got the strategic uh, one on board. I think there are two um, two aspects I would I would look at. I don't know enough about the the French ecosystem, but I can talk about you know what I see in the UK and and it's heavily influenced by the US as well. I think first is competition. So in London in particular, um, talking about social impact, right? We are competing with people who, with great technologists and engineers who would want to work for DeepMind, who would want to work for you know, uh, Google and all those big guys that promised them huge social impact and were like, hey, you love games, come to us, right? So I think there's the competitive environment as well. Uh, and I think the other, the other aspect is uh, what is the business you want to create? I think that's a very, very important question. When we decided to buy back the company to become totally independent, um, we were very sure at the time that we wanted to create the way we wanted as more of a lifestyle um, type of business. Uh, and then later on, as things progress, we're like, actually, I think we're now ready to go into the high growth again. And these are very two very different businesses. Lifestyle would, you know, you, you pay your salary and you, you just need to make a little bit of money. High growth is about 10x, is about getting something that would value more than 10 times than what investor invested. So I think these are the two things, environment and what is the business you want to create. This will dictate what you want to do. 
just something to add to that, which I think is interesting is, um, it's very nice to see when students come out of school, basically, that they are actually more and more aware you know, that a studio needs only to make great games, but you know, they need to make money out of it. And when we take decisions, when we need to monetize around the games, um, they do understand that you know, it's, we're being creative, but we need to make money as well. And I think so when we have these discussions you know, with the team, it's always very healthy. Uh, and that is, I don't, I don't know if it, it is a new trend or when you know, from the schools in education where you know, they understand that, but it's, it's good and healthy, basically, that we, it's not all about making good games and we don't care if it's being sold or not. And if I can uh, complement that answer, uh, I think in France, we, uh, video game people usually, they want to, uh, to make projects and they want to uh, get projects funded and usually investors, they don't get, they don't invest in projects, they, in, they invest in companies uh, that can be there for, for 10 years. And I think in France, we see companies as these evil things, you know, managed by evil bosses. And we don't like companies so much, you know, uh, as, as French people. And we have a tendency to, to shy away from the company thing. And we need to, to get that culture of, you know, building studios, building companies, not just financing projects and financing dream games, but really to be there for the long term and to build a company that's going to last for 10, 20, 30 years. And that's, I think, for me, the, uh, one of the key difference between France and what's being done in the UK or the Nordics where they really focus on the long term and on the companies and what your company is about and what it, what it is trying to build. <laughs>